Salamat sore. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's lovely to have you all here, both virtually uh, and also to actually be in a room with people is just wonderful. So uh, this is great. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations, on whose land many of us are gathered here today. I pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would like to begin uh, now by thanking His Excellency, Mr. Gary Quinlan, Australia's Ambassador to Indonesia. Unfortunately, the Ambassador can't be here in person today, but he has sent a video message that we'll watch shortly. I want to welcome also via Zoom our uh, evil speaker, Tutu Hatu Newa, the outgoing Consul General for Victoria and Tasmania. I also welcome Ibu Muniro uh, Rahim, Acting Consul General, and Ibu Pratalia Rosal, um, the Consul for Information and Socio-Cultural Affairs. Welcome also uh, to Professor Margaret Gardner, AC President and Vice-Chancellor of Monash University, Professor Andrew McIntyre, Senior Pro Vice-Chancellor, Southeast Asia Partnerships, and Professor Sharon Pickering, the Dean of Monash Arts. And of course, to all of you who are joining us here today online and also in person. It's lovely to see you all here this afternoon, both face to face and virtually. From wherever you are across the world, welcome to Monash. My name is Sharon Graham Davies, and I'm the new director of the Herb Feith Indonesian Engagement Centre here at Monash. Having taken over, from Professor Ariel Herianto last year. The Herb Feed Centre is a dynamic platform for developing strong collaborations and exchange between academic researchers, the creative sector, government, industry, alumni leaders uh, from across Monash and Indonesia. The centre acts as a hub for engaging Indonesia, providing a platform for media outreach from Monash and Indonesia partners, through research briefs, commentary on public issues, short videos, social media posts, uh, and this, our Herb Feith Dialogue. So I'm thrilled today to be able to open our first Herb Feith Dialogue of 2021, and that we are able to run this dialogue in a hybrid format, which hopefully will all go smoothly. We uh, will record the event and it will be available shortly for viewing on the Herb Feith website. So, without further ado, I invite President and Vice-Chancellor of Monash University, Professor Margaret Gardner, to take the stage and say a few words. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Associate Professor Davies. And uh, let me also acknowledge that we meet here on the lands of the Wurundjeri and the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And can I also acknowledge in, in his absence, we're sorry, he's unable to be with us because of illness, His Excellency uh, Mr Gary Quinlan, the Australian Ambassador to Indonesia, from whom you will hear by a recorded message later. Let me particularly be pleased that there with us in person um, is Ibu Munaro Rahim, the Acting Consul, Consul General of, of Indonesia for Victoria and Tasmania. And can I thank some not with us and some with us, uh, uh, Ibu Speaker uh, Tuta Ha Tunaywa, the outgoing Consul General of Indonesia for Victoria and Tasmania, to welcome um, Ibu Putalia Rasul, the Consul for Information and Sociocultural Affairs, can I welcome my um, wonderful and distinguished colleagues, Professor Andrew McIntyre, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Southeast Asian Partnerships, and Professor Sharon Pickering, the Dean of Arts, and the many distinguished people who are here with us. Um, we're really thrilled to see you. Um, Salamat siang. Um, can I say I am also delighted to be here and to be part of the welcome to you at today's Herb Feith Dialogue albeit, as we all know, in a different format from what we had originally planned and from how we have conducted these in the past. On the other hand, doing it in this format, we are able to reach many people simultaneously um, uh, across a, a wider range than we could if we were just trying to squeeze you into one room, uh, congenial though that one room may be. Uh, can I say uh, it is a wonderful special occasion um, 
And this occasion, I'd like to acknowledge, to take the opportunity to acknowledge the success of the Monash Herb Feath Indonesian Engagement Centre, which was established in 2018. It is a really important flagship centre of the Faculty of Arts. You've heard from Associate Professor Davies of what it does. And the centre has done many things. I've been fortunate to be able to be part of a number of its dialogues, but it is engaging, not just looking and understanding, but actively engaging across numerous academic and government delegations and officials from within and, uh, and outside Australia and within and outside Indonesia. Uh, it, it's a very important bilateral engagement. It holds monthly seminars. It holds major events like these. It's covered such a range of issues from arts and activism to Muslim preachers in politics, journalism of Islam, um, media and the environment. It, it really is just the sort of depth and breadth of cultural engagement that makes, makes the links that are important between Australia and Indonesia. Um, it's also um, part of the educational and research excellence that Monash has built over the past 60 years. An important part of that educational and research, research excellence has been part of our strong connection with Indonesia from our very early years. It's not like Monash found Indonesia recently. Monash and Indonesia found one another from their very beginnings in the 1960s. And in particular, the Monash Arts Faculty has, has established from that time and maintained strong research and teaching links with Indonesia and has ongoing relationships with more than 30 Indonesian universities. And of course, the centre is named after Herb Feith, who was really a pioneer in Australian academia in that type of engagement between Australia and Indonesia and really made that a lively and successful engagement. Um, the Faculty of Arts itself has many partnerships, as I've said, with Indonesian university partners, but also with industry partners ranging from government bodies through um, departments, cultural bodies, NGOs and others. There's considerable joint research published, um, indeed hundreds of research co-publications. And the other thing that makes this link really live is that Monash has currently more than 1,200 Indonesian students enrolled at our Australian campuses. And by our calculations, and we think we can stand by them, Monash has graduated more Indonesian citizens than any other university in the world outside universities in Indonesia, of course. Uh, and so we have some 5,500 Monash alumni, many, uh, alumni residing in Indonesia, many of them who came to Monash in Australia from Indonesia, but, but, not, but others who've gone from Australia to Indonesia and are our alumni. We have many, many... Um, ways of engaging and I think it's important that that engagement deepens and broadens with every year that passes. Perhaps one of the most notable developments for Monash, um, if I can speak for us, um, it most recently is our commitment because of the approval of the Indonesian government to the opening of a new Monash Indonesia campus which will be, which was approved late last year and will open later in this year, we're really extremely proud at Monash to be the first foreign university invited and approved by the Indonesian government to establish a campus in Indonesia. And we have great hopes for that campus. Based in Jakarta, it will be research intensive, industry engaged, it will be focused on postgraduate degrees, masters and PhD degrees, as well as ongoing professional and executive development. And we expect the first master's students to start in October. But it's not only those links. We have ongoing deep research projects. We have a, a, a project called Revitalising Informal Settlements and Their Environments Project, which is funded by uh, Wellcome Trust and the Asian Development Bank and is um, working to improve water supply and sanitation and therefore... Therefore, the public health, the health outcomes of Indonesian uh, citizens 
RISE is Monash's largest internationally funded uh, research project and it is taking place in 12 communities across Makassar with strong support from the Makassar Mayor, from government ministries, local authorities, NGOs and our university partners. So we have had students, we have continued to educate, we have an ongoing research, not from a distance, but in Indonesia, with Indonesian uh, organisations. Um, it's been a long time building that relationship and we think it is a relationship that has much to deliver and much further to go. Um, one of the most important things that happened most recently, again driven by the Faculty of Arts, was what was called the, uh, what still is called, the Global Immersion Guarantee, which guaranteed uh, an immersion for students in, in our first year of the arts faculty, which is a large number of students in countries overseas. And that project has seen significant numbers of students from our Australian campuses travel to Indonesia where they've participated in a whole range of field trips, projects and immersion in the culture, gaining hands-on experience with local agencies in Yogya and Bali and Jakarta, seeing real world challenges as they play out, not just in the city where they grew up, but in Indonesia, assuming that many of those who go are of course people who didn't originally come from Indonesia. And that changes the way people understand how you work together and what, what the nature of those challenges are. And those students have been looking at real world challenges, including food and water security, the impacts of mass tourism, on natural environments, rapid urbanisation. These are all things that have been ex are experienced in different ways all around the world and it's important that people understand context, culture and the way they can work most effectively to, in those challenges. So we have been supported by the Australian Government through the new Colombo Plan to send our students through that Global Immersion Guarantee and apart from last year, the closing of borders prevented them from going there. We have that was a small glip, glitch in our program, but it has not stopped the commitment, and we are intending to expand it. And we are strengthening our relations, and we intend that there should be more of this sort of deep exchange by students that start with us in Australia and come to understand Indonesia through that program as well as how we work with Indonesian agencies to understand in research what can be done collectively and jointly to address real world challenges, just as we work to build education, not just here in Australia, but through our auspices in Indonesia. Um, we are able to do that because Indonesia has been a warm and welcoming place. That makes the experience for our students and our researchers from wherever they come, <laughs> whether they came to us from Indonesia or from somewhere else, that makes their experience better and richer and makes them better global citizens, we believe, in the end. We're endlessly grateful to Indonesia for enabling the opportunities we have had and we will have to work collaboratively with Indonesia in education and research now and into the future. We're determined that there will be a generation of Australian graduates, and I remind you that Monash is the largest university in Australia, so it's not a small commitment <laughs> when we're talking about our, the engagement of our, our, our graduates with Indonesia, that they will have a deep understanding and appreciation of Indonesia in all the diversity of its cultures and its languages and all the richness of the experience it brings and the richness of the aspirations it has for its future. And that ability to work more deeply with Indonesia, to build that global, global literacy, to build that cultural consciousness, to actually provide the foundations for the tolerance that makes all of us, wherever we live, in a better place 
In this region, there is almost nothing more important than our ability to engage across Australia and Indonesia. I think that the Herb Feet Centre, in the name of Herb Feet, is doing great work in this. Um, we have our Indonesian colleagues to thank for it and the, and the commitment of our staff and students to that project. Terima kasih. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vice-Chancellor. It's just really uh, wonderful, as, as someone quite new to Monash, to hear about that depth and breadth and that real commitment that Monash has to um, Indonesia. Now, we're moving now to the um, video that Ambassador Quinlan has sent us, so I think I can sit down and it will play. Salamat sore. Good afternoon. I'm Gary Quinlan. I've been ambassador of Australia to Indonesia for the past three years, and it's great to be here this evening, although not uh, in person, but virtually. We all do our engagements virtually these days and have for almost a year. And I think it's been a revelation to all of us, certainly to me, of how effective that kind of virtual interaction can be, and of course, how essential it is. Uh, I want to thank uh, Vice-Chancellor Margaret Gardner, of course, of Monash. Uh, also, Professor Sharon Davies, the new director of the Herb Feet Centre. Especially, of course, and preeminently, uh, Indonesian Consul General Ibu Spisa and also Professor Andrew Byrne and Professor Sharon Pickering. And, of course, above all, thank you all for tuning in to us today. Monash, of course, as we all know, is one of Australia's great educational institution, among the greatest, and preeminently one invested very heavily in Indonesia and in the relationship between our two countries. There's not only this centre under whose auspices we're meeting today, but also the fact, as you know, that Monash is on the verge of opening um, its university campus in Indonesia, the first foreign university in Indonesia and that despite COVID. So the momentum is there and it's been a tremendous effort and we congratulate uh, everybody at Monash and elsewhere and in the Indonesian government system associated with achieving that wonderful outcome. Now, the subject of Australia-Indonesia relations 2021 and beyond. Now, that's a, a pretty big subject. So I want to limit myself, obviously, in the time available to sort of um, some headline points, which uh, hopefully will help crystallise additional thinking by all of us who are so engaged in the relationship as we map out and chart an even better future between the two countries. First of all, I want to emphasise the fact that relations between our two countries are very resilient. Sometimes people have thought, oh, they're a little bit fragile, but they're not. History has shown how resilient they are. They should be resilient because we're neighbours and you certainly hope they would be. But time has told and it is a resilient relationship. And COVID-19 and our aligned responses to what has been globally the most disruptive event for all of us since World War II, our aligned response between these two neighbours, us, has shown exactly how resilient the relationship is. We've been at a turning point, an historic turning point, between our two countries over the past few years. And the reason is, I think, because the rest of the region, and in fact the world, has been at a turning point. And this predates COVID. COVID has made that turning point and what it means for all of us that much clearer, that much starker. But the trends that were changing our world and the calculus that each of our governments, each of our countries brings into play when it thinks, of, thinks about our places in the world, those trends were already there. The historic shift to the Asia-Pacific, what is now broadly known as the Indo-Pacific, the historic shift of political, economic, strategic gravity to our part of the world, the massive technological change we're all experiencing, fastest change in human history, and that, of course, makes everything uh, more volatile, more difficult to cope with, and, of course, profound ecological change. All of these things 
uh, have led each of our countries, Indonesia and Australia, to assess what is happening, what's going on, and what do those changes mean for each of us. And each of us actually make the same judgments. Our policy choices on how to deal with that uh, uh, dramatic change will inevitably vary a bit. But in fact, we make the same kind of assessments. And as a result of that, despite occasional differences over policy, but not important, uh, we are fundamentally aligned with each other. And above all, we are very, very actively focused on how we can both become more resilient countries ourselves and with each other by shaping the region in which we live, by combining our respective convening power and operational power to leverage the kind of cooperation we need to shape our region. Now, President Widodo visited um, Canberra, Australia, on a state visit uh, a year ago, February last year. Um, I had the good fortune uh, to be present for that visit, and he addressed the Australian Parliament during the visit. Only the second Indonesian uh, president to do so after SBY in 2010. And during that address to Parliament, President Widodo described Australia, and I quote, as Indonesia's closest friend. Now, leaders, of course, and diplomats always say that kind of thing. But the fact is, and particularly if you're addressing a parliament, but the fact is that it's true. Politically, the two countries have never been closer. During the visit, both leaders announced a plan of action to operationalise, to put into effect, implement uh, the comprehensive strategic partnership, which was signed off and adopted by both leaders during Prime Minister Morrison's first visit to Indonesia as Prime Minister, six days after he became Prime Minister in Australia in August uh, 2018. Now, there are five operational pillars and serious pillars in this detailed plan of action, five pillars under the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Four of them are sort of bilateral, you know, economic cooperation, uh, people-to-people cooperation, security and defence, maritime. And then there's a fifth pillar, uniquely, where both countries set out different areas where we can cooperate with each other to shape the region. The uh, Comprehensive Strategic Partnership and both our countries have very few of these agreements. They're the top level diplomatic agreement that you can have with another country. Um, And we only have a handful uh, uh, of these agreements, each one of us, Indonesia and Australia. They are important because they make our cooperation accountable, systematic, routine. The Australian Cabinet will receive a report every six months on the implementation of that plan. And that's unique because it is so important to us. So that's a game changer. The other big game changer for the next decade as we map out the future or try and map out the future is the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership, i.e. CHEPA. And that came into force last July during COVID. So that's there. Our response to COVID-19 has actually shown the response between us and certainly on Australia's part, how closely aligned we are, our two leaders, have been in regular contact by telephone, exchanging notes on what's happening with COVID-19 in each country, regionally and globally, and aligning policy to influence other countries in their response and to try and get some global leadership on COVID-19. There has been an absence of leadership on global on COVID-19 it's it's just been obvious so two middle countries like Australia middle powers have needed to cooperate more closely to bring the right kind of messaging to other countries about how serious the problems are and how quickly we needed to act so leaders have been in contact the foreign ministers constantly in regular contact the defense ministers on the phone um, regularly every month and the heads of our defense forces likewise our treasurer and ministers for finance and some other ministers 
um, in very specialised areas, I, IT, communications, those kind of issues, all been having a constant dialogue to exchange notes and align ourselves with each other. We've put a tremendous effort into ensuring that all the regular meetings we have at ministerial level every year and at officials level take place so that we didn't lose momentum and create a much bigger gap than, uh, than we need and want, despite the pressures of COVID and the difficulties on counter-terrorism, on cyber security, on maritime and border issues, on law and security issues, on education, all of those engagements have been happening. And I think that, in fact, the regularity of that engagement between Australia and Indonesia has been the most we've, we have had, Australia, with any other single country, and the most Indonesia has had, despite the challenges of COVID. We inaugurated a new senior economic officials meeting last August. That will be a very important part of our economic relationship on policy into the future. We will soon be issuing a what we call a blueprint um, for business on how to take the opportunities that IHEPA offer and do something about them. This is what you can do. We, we try and give a bit of a, a guide as to how you can best utilise the opportunity of that agreement. We'll soon be having a uh, an inaugural senior economic ministers meeting, our trade, investment and economic ministers. We'll be having our two plus two, that's our defence and foreign ministers in both countries meeting soon, uh, maybe virtually, but maybe if we can manage it uh, in person. We're working on that. And also um, our annual defence ministers meeting and another very interesting meeting, um, the first trilateral foreign ministers meeting between Australia, Indonesia, India. This is a new trilateral relationship in the region focused on how we can help each other build resilience in the Indo-Pacific. And of course, later this year, we will have our annual leaders meeting. Also in our COVID response, our development program um, and partnership with Indonesia, we pivoted that to the COVID-19 response and Indonesia's own priorities for that response as soon as it was evident that COVID-19 was going to be so disastrous for everybody. We pivoted that program for a focus on technical and economic and governance advice, public health advice, social protection, these key areas as priorities in Indonesia's own response. We extended um, late last year a loan uh, for $1.5 billion for budget support, direct budget support, uh, to Indonesia's COVID response, and we will continue to keep looking closely at whether some additional fiscal support in the future might be useful. Now, of course, we're also working on vaccines, and we have a $100 million program, $101.9 million program announced recently, focused on Indonesia as part of a broader half a billion dollar program on vaccines for the region. And of course, we'll continue to work on vaccines because they are the light at the end of the tunnel, they are so essential. Now, of course, um, we know that we can't just, in looking at the future, revert to the 2020 settings or the pre-COVID settings. COVID has changed everything. We know that. Indonesia's own economy, of course, uh, went backwards, contracted um, in 2020 for the first time since the Asian financial crisis in 1998 poverty rate, unemployment have increased, a large number of small businesses have had to close, education, and I want to emphasise that, has been particularly affected with schools basically closed for almost a year with a, with a bad impact and big impact on the younger generation. And youth and education, always the key to the future, but the key to the future between our two countries, youth and education, these are the key and the areas we need to really focus our continued programs and cooperation on. The difficulties of the public health system have become very obvious um, and the need for really well-targeted, effective social protection systems and also money. Because business contracted, went backwards, the amount of money available through tax to the Indonesian government has fallen substantially. And so 
at the time when there is a bigger and bigger demand for expenditure on education, social protection, assistance uh, to industry to rebuild, at that very time, money available to do that has declined. So uh, the need for revenue boosting through tax reform has become so much more obvious. Now, we expect that President Widodo uh, will make every effort to continue to keep the economy open so it can grow. And um, we expect that will continue, uh, despite the fact that COVID-19 is um, going to become, uh, remain, obviously, a serious problem, uh, at least for another year. And, of course, um, the government's vaccination program in a country which is so vast, the fourth largest country in the world, massive archipelago, that vaccination program um, will need to continue to have wide effectiveness at least until the second quarter of next year. The Indonesian government's own budget estimate is the economy of Indonesia will have contracted, gone backwards by about 7%, will be 7% smaller than it was pre-COVID. I mention all of this to indicate um, the ecosystem with which our two countries are dealing. Australia has... Uh, and it has and is coming out of the uh, pandemic uh, better than a lot of other countries, but um, uh, not without challenges. But in terms of the cooperation needed between our two countries in this scene, clearly we in Australia need to be very alert, very sensitive, conscious of the really difficult ecosystem that our biggest neighbour and friend is facing. Now, I shouldn't talk for too much longer. Looking to the future... Um, I think, first of all, let me make one or two comments on the economic side. Uh, I've mentioned IA Chepa, and this will establish a new platform for economic integration over the next decade once we start to rebuild and get out of the immediate bad impacts of COVID-19. Areas where we're going to particularly focus, apart from trade, of course, and the trade between the two countries has not um, been affected as badly as we feared. In fact, it's gone down a little bit, but in some areas it's gone up and has favoured Indonesia in some areas. So we want to see more of that, frankly. But we want to focus also very much on services and investment. Getting Australian investment in, into Indonesia and getting more Indonesian investment into Australia, a good thing. Areas in particular that IA Chepa, I think, opens up uh, for business is private health care, tourism infrastructure, anything to do with uh, digital startups and the digital economy, education, particularly vocational education and training, and renewable energy. Uh, and this is going to be a big focus of the future. We're also about to sign uh, fairly soon a new uh, memorandum of understanding of cooperation on agribusiness between the two countries and developing a new way in which we can get better integrated supply chains to work with Indonesian business for Indonesia's food security. And that's quite vital. I should mention our development cooperation partnership will obviously continue uh, and it will continue over the next couple of years to give a big focus to um, uh, the economic recovery from COVID to public health needs to technical and economic advice um, broadly, to social protection, and traditionally um, a focus also on disaster management. So they'll be um, the foci, if you like, of where we're going with IA Chepa and the development program in the future. Another area I'll mention, counter-terrorism, because it's always of interest to people. Indonesia has some of the best counter-terrorism um, uh, people anywhere in the world, in any country which faces a level of terrorism of any, of any threat. Uh, Australia and Indonesia remain the closest partners in our region on counter-terrorism. Our two police forces have the closest relationship of any two police forces anywhere in the world to resist counter-terrorism. Um, but it's there. It'll always be there, probably. Um, uh, but it's an area where we do a tremendous amount very positively with each other. I'll mention cyber and cyber security issues because the threat of cyber intrusions to our critical infrastructure, 
to our national security and to our digital economy has become so much starker and so much more obvious uh, to each of our countries over the last few years and the threat from disinformation, the misuse of cyber opportunity. We will be working much, much more closely on those threats jointly um, over the coming decade. Defence, we do actually have very good defence relations and always have an occasional hiccup in relations up and down. Uh, we haven't had that for a long time. We don't expect to. Um, defence cooperation is actually quite strong, particularly with training, and that's going to increase. And new areas of procurement, of buying equipment, we're both developing our own defence industries. So there's more opportunity over the forthcoming decade and all of that, and more and more joint operations one thing I want to mention, because it's historically symbolic but really potent, is that we are working on finalising arrangements for uh, an Australian and Indonesian co-deployment on UN peacekeeping. This was announced by our Defence and Foreign Ministers uh, a year ago, and we're working on it now. Uh, that, um, if you think about it, is an, is, is an historic development, as I said, our two countries contributing peacekeepers together under a joint mandate of the UN Security Council to look after peace and security in a part, that hasn't been announced, which country yet or which peacekeeping mission, in our own region. Historic. Um, that kind of cooperation, I think, will just continue routinely into the future. And also we'll be doing a lot more work on uh, joint deployments on humanitarian and security relief. Maritime, anything our two countries do on maritime is by definition vital and important to both of us. Uh, we're both maritime countries, Indonesia, the greatest archipelago in the world, huge number of islands, vast space of ocean, much of which you share with us. And we are, we're a continent, but a small country in population size, but a massive country in terms of uh, uh, geography. And then we have India as the other great maritime country in our immediate region. So you've got the three countries, which is why trilateral cooperation in maritime is going to be so much more important, because we share the same maritime ecosystem and challenges and the same maritime strategic geography. We'll be doing a lot more cooperation in the Indian Ocean. We'll be focusing more on plastic waste, what we can do together. CSIRO in Australia is doing some work uh, with others, uh, Indonesian counterparts on what we can do there, and more and more effort to um, combat illegal fishing. Internationally, uh, we are both great proponents of an Indo-Pacific vision for our region and, of course, um, ASEAN. We, Australia, see ASEAN as absolutely vital and central to the regional strategic calculus, the calculus which needs to be secure, but also to deliver prosperity for each of us. And we'll continue to work closely on that. Uh, we are at the moment um, uh, very, very uh, pleased to see the leadership being shown by Foreign Minister Retno uh, within ASEAN and the region on Myanmar and what we do about that. We're your strongest supporters always in ASEAN Australia. We have been your first dialogue partner since 1974. And everybody in this country, from the Prime Minister down, when they speak of foreign policy, always say one of the two or three key operating principles is the importance of ASEAN. We're both members of the G20. We sometimes forget that. Indonesia, we're both G20 economies. Indonesia will be chairman of the G20 next year, and we're already tightly engaged in talking to each other how we can um, work together on the agenda and how do you get results out of a G20 dialogue, and also is there a way with uh, expertise that we can exchange to develop the capacity uh, for the G20. We're both working very closely together on reform of the World Trade Organization, where Indonesia has taken a leadership role, and Australia as well, and also WHO, the World Health Organization reform. We'll be working ever more closely on that. I'll conclude by mentioning people-to-people -people links. Now, these are, are always the hardest, uh, in a sense, to assess and characterise because they depend ultimately on 
not just what we know about each other, but also what we feel about each other. So it's very difficult to sort of uh, assess how successful people-to-people relations are going. Obviously, youth are the key. And given the fact that Indonesia is one of the greatest young countries in the world, will always continue to be a key um, as we map out the next decade. Education, we were really making great progress. More and more co- uh, connection. The new Colombo plan from Australia, the Indonesia, the preferred country of choice. Uh, and in the first five years of the new Colombo plan, 10,000 Australian students spent time in Indonesia. We've lost some of that momentum because of COVID-19. We've engaged the program virtually, the mobility programs. We're going to have to work extra hard to rebuild that. And the university framework in Australia to help support our teachers, um, the New Colombo Plan. We do need to put a lot more effort into uh, study and research collaborations between our best institutes and our best universities and what Monash, of course, Uh, is doing in Indonesia and plans to do in the future is a very exciting pointer to the future in that. Tourism will take a while to rebuild. Indonesia is the second most preferred country in the world, destination for Australians to be tourists in. The other one is New Zealand. And we need to rebuild that. Of course, we're hostage to when the borders can reopen. But once they can, safely, There are a lot of Australians already making plans to see how they can re-engage with their favourite place in the world, for obvious reasons, Um, Bali. We need to get more Australians out of just Bali, by the way, and get them to visit other great parts of Indonesia, and it's something we need to do some more work on. Culturally, COVID-19 has had a big, big impact on the cultural communities in both countries. And we've lost, you know, some of the momentum in the exchanges in the cultural area. We've done our best to keep things going. Uh, I've opened uh, well, four or five different art exhibitions over the last six, seven months and other cultural events in particular, so we didn't lose momentum. I've done all of that virtually with other people to try and maintain that effort, but we're going to have to double down and do more to rebuild some of that. And I'll conclude by mentioning interfaith connections. Um, both Prime Minister Morrison, President Widodo, and President Widodo and former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull made this a priority of our engagement with a, with a direct personal commitment that each of our leaders has brought to that. We began uh, an interfaith dialogue formally two years ago in Bandung, and we want to resume that as soon as we can, even if we have to do it virtually. I had a conversation the other day with Indonesia's new Minister for Religious Affairs, and we're going to work on this as a commitment over the next few months. This is an area where, obviously, we in Australia have a lot to learn from Indonesia's experience of Islam, and we want to understand Islam as a country with a relatively small Muslim population. We want to understand Islam through Indonesian eyes. You have a lot to teach us in Indonesia about this, and we have a healthy appetite to learn more in that area. Now, there's no doubt um, we need to redouble our efforts, particularly on the people-to-people uh, front, and that's where you, who've tuned in this afternoon, are so important as well, Because I hope you can continue to be not just interested observers in discussions about our two countries and where we're going and planning for a better future together, but that you can be really active ambassadors in widening the catchment of people who we need to get engaged in what we're doing between the two countries. Because Indonesia's success is Australia's success. I'm quoting our Prime Minister to that effect. Uh, It's absolutely true. And we are linked historically uh, since independence, your strongest supporter in Indonesia for Indonesian independence. And and we always will be. So uh, I look forward to continuing to work for a short time um, this year uh, before I conclude my posting later in the year, uh, my three-year assignment. But I look forward to trying to pull together some more threads and working with Monash in particular uh, and the centre, uh, which I'm really pleased to engage with this way again um, as we map out that future. So thank you, and um, uh, I hope you have some good discussions today with some of those questions. Terima kasih.
Thank you so much, Ambassador Quinlan. It was wonderful to hear your reflections and to encourage all of us to take up that challenge uh, to be ambassadors and keep building uh, those relationships further. Now, I think we have Ibu Speaker Tutu Hutu Newa, who will zoom in live as long as there are no thunderstorms happening in Jakarta. Um, <laughs> in which event, she has very um, uh, prudently sent through uh, a pre-recorded piece. And she is here. <laughs> Tira Arahujan di Jakarta. Hello, Ibu Chan. Hi. I will turn over to you and let you say a few words. I'm so pleased you could join us. Thank you very much, Ibu, Ibu Sharon. Um, hopefully the internet connection is good enough uh, for the Zoom in, in Melbourne. But truly pleasure and honor for me to speak with you um, here. Uh, also, thank you for Professor Margaret Gardner, Professor Sharon Pickering, Professor Andrew McIntyre, and the whole team of Monash University. Thank you so much. Um, I already sent my video uh, to Herb Fifth and Monash Uni, but there are two things or three that I would like to say. First of all, we had uh, so many um, programs and activities in the past, and I hope and I believe that it should be the foundation and for us to continue on. Second of all, this is for the beyond 2021. Uh, the first, I believe, in invest in education. So uh, from the primary, secondary, and university level, um, I believe that we should invest in the future. There are many programs uh, that we already established and should be developed even further. Uh, first at the primary, if we can have the virtual students exchange more and more, and I'm uh, glad that I was uh, fully supported by the Department of Education and Training uh, in Victoria. Thank you very much, Pajol. Um, and that should be continued. Second of all, for the Young Generation Program of Australia Indonesia Center, AIC in Monash, uh, like the um, Real Oz In, that is also a very good format to engage the young generation and for them to encourage, uh, get them to stay connected. The third uh, is the connection or the program between Melbourne and Bandung, and that's supported by the university level of Indonesia and Victoria, and that also an encouraging foundation for us to invest for the future. Uh, second point beyond 2021 is the collaboration and the cooperation between Indonesia and Australia should look further beyond the bilateral. So we should look for the bigger audience, audience in the region, for example, uh, in Indo-Pacific now, or even at the global level. I'm a diplomat, I believe in collaboration and uh, cooperation. And I believe that with that, we not only grow together, but then we can contribute more to the region and as well to, to the global. Terima kasih banyak again. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Terima kasih, Ibu. Professor Margaret Gatner, Sharon Pickering, and everyone else in the room. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I'm so pleased you could join us. Um, I now invite Professor Andrew McIntyre to come up and uh, start the more interactive part where we, we'll take some questions and, and answers and, and invite people up. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Um, hi to everyone here in the room uh, in Melbourne today and hi to the many more people uh, that are joining us um, uh, uh, online. Um, so, uh, speaker, who was speaker, and uh, Gary, Gary Quinlan, um, you can quickly see why these two people are such effective advocates, such effective champions of the uh, Australia-Indonesia partnership. Um, not everyone may know, although you may guess, that they've also been tremendously good friends to Monash. They've, in so many ways, in their different capacities, um, helped this university uh, with its priorities. So they're two special stars. But, you know, it seems to me there's another star in this room that needs attention this evening, and that's Sharon Davies. Um, uh, uh, I'm saying this particularly for people online. Um, you may not yet realise um, just how important Sharon's recruitment to the university is. Uh, how important the Herb Feed Centre is. Um, there's all sorts of centres in universities around the world that work on Indonesia. I, I know many of them. There is none like the Herb Feed Centre. There is none that has the focus of the Herb Feed Centre, the particular focus, the particular energy, 
and the community connections that this, this center has. Um, watch this space. Sharon's going to be taking it into new, even, even new and, and greater heights. So, so watch this space. But look, that's not my job tonight. My, my job's supposed to be doing Q&A. And, and, and I, I was really supposed to just be the go-between between you, you and, uh, and Gary Quinlan. I'm going to do my best to sort of facilitate. Um, there's a whole range of fabulous questions that have been submitted by people out there in, in webinar land. And I'm not going to be able to put them to Gary on your behalf, and I'm not going to attempt to give Gary's answers to those questions, because there's not much point in that. Um, but if you just think of some of the themes he touched on uh, in, the, in, in that address, what were some of those key, key words? A resilient relationship. A relationship that's, over the last few years, at a turning point. And he was using that in a, in a, positive, in a positive way, yeah. Um, he said these two countries, despite periodic and not that significant policy differences, are fundamentally aligned. Um, he, um, he, he spoke of how we're working together to shape our region. And he picked up on that um, phrase of um, President Joko Widodo when he was giving his state address in Parliament last year. And he said, Australia is Indonesia's closest friend. And I remember that phrase because a lot of us said, is that right? And then talking to my Indonesian friends afterwards, they said, Andrew, yes, it is right. Think of another country that Indonesia would regard as a closer friend. There are countries that are geographically closer. There's countries that Indonesia does more stuff with. Um, but the point my Indonesian friends were making to me, and I think it's the point the president was making, and not everyone realizes it, is on all sorts of stuff, there's a surprising amount of trust and collaboration. And we don't realize that. Anyway, interesting, interesting. I can't, I can't bring all you people out there in webinar land uh, in to talk with Gary, but what I can do, there's a few people in the room who had submitted questions, and um, until, until somebody looks at me and tells me to stop, I'm just going to pull one or, one or two in to give you, give you a flavour. And, um, and one, of the, uh, one of the people in the room uh, is Diana Pratiwi, and, and, and Diana, can I just invite you to come out and, 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 and join me here at the, at the, at the podium? Um, we can't talk to Gary, but just as you're coming up, just let me introduce you to people in the room and um, in webinar land. Um, Diana is uh, a vice president of the Indonesian uh, Diaspora um, Association. Um, if I'm not mistaken... She's also the mother of a Monash student, <laughs> which is at least as fantastic a, a qualification. But, 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 but Diana, I, I know the, the questions you put in, two really interesting questions. Um, one was about IHEPA, um, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and whether COVID's knocked that off track and what we might expect. Now, you were expecting to put a question to Gary yes. on that. But let me put you on the spot um, uh, and, and, and ask you, what did you think of what Gary had to say on that yeah. subject? Because th there was a lot of interesting stuff that he had to say. Yeah, I think uh, at high level, he mm -mm. has answered some of my uh, questions. Mm -mm. But it is because maybe in the short term, you can, he cannot actually explain in detail. Mm -mm. But uh, I'm interested in regards to what can be done in the future, just people to people. Mm -hmm. That's the one that I feel that it is not enough mm -mm. because I am, I've been living here for 20 years and I'm one of the leaders of Indonesian diaspora who live in Australia. Mm -hmm. But I haven't had a lot of like uh, engagement mm -hmm. how her fit center or Australian government or Victorian level or the, the national wide to actually engage with Indonesian diaspora because we are here. Mm. So we have a lot of connections. 
not only about uh, economics, but also agriculture, mm -hmm. and also about uh, politics too, mm -hmm. and also about uh, how to make, uh, how to actually engage the, the countryside. Mm -hmm. Because we also, one of the examples that we are doing is also we, we try to help a village to become a smart village. Mm -hmm. But it is a lot of um, challenges. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can work together with her Herb Center or Monash Uni mm -hmm. to actually help the remote area of Indonesia mm -hmm. to actually can uh, can leverage the Iacepa mm -hmm. because they have a lot of um, capacity, but they need to actually put all together in the database how to actually make the product is actually available to actually export to mm. uh, Australia with the, the good quality here. So we can work together through diaspora and then we can do what, what the people to people uh, connection we can do in the future. Mm. So that I think I want to touch best mm. more on that one. Mm. Yeah. Very, very interesting. You, you also had a question um, about bilateral security, counter-terrorism efforts, and that sort of thing. Were you interested in, in what Gary had to say on that subject? Oh, yes, yes, because uh, as the uh, Indonesian diaspora, we have a lot of uh, engagement with people in Indonesian people in Australia and also in Indonesia, how to actually make sure that we are we always in the moderate space, mm. not to to the right, not mm. to the left, because mm. terrorism and radicalism is normally if we are not in the middle. Mm. So we have engaged to become like the moderation movement. Mm. So and then um, because now around the world trying to become to to grab into another ideology mm. or the other ideology. Ideology. So mm. we already like conducted uh, like pan like session about Pancasila, mm -hmm. and and actually Pancasila also related to Australia. Too. It's, it's it's the same. It is like Australia has the same kind of ideology to Indonesia. But do you know about Pancasila? We mm -hmm. have like about uh, about five the belief. Yeah, yeah five, the five principle. So so I think it is important mm. because. Uh, to engage with Indonesian diaspora and other Indonesian community mm -hmm. too, because sometimes, even though they uh, live here, sometimes they try to also grab the community to the other side. Mm -hmm. So we try to make sure go back to the middle. Mm -hmm. Not not moderation is, I think, the way mm -hmm. at the moment because uh, when politics becoming uh, too much political identity, then terrorism and radicalism will become the issue now mm. and in the future. Mm. Uh, really interesting comments. Thank you, Diana. I, I've got to say, I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear what Gary had to say about just how intensive the and, and how long-standing the collaboration is at various levels of government, um, uh, including he was saying in policing, specifically in counter-terrorism, he said there are no two other police forces anywhere in the yeah, world yeah. working together as closely as this. Yeah, but at high level, probably mm -hmm. they have done something, but we need to start thinking at, this yeah, at the level. community, mm -hmm. at the grassroots. Maybe a mm -hmm. centre can start to work together with us. Or... Well, you, you and I can make a joint yes. memo and we'll submit it to Sharon Davies. <laughs> 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 Diana, thanks very much for Thank being you. such a wonderful participant Thank up here. Yes. All right. And, and if Sharon's not telling me to... She, Sharon says I'm allowed to have one more. Sharon says I'm allowed to have one more. Um, uh, if Sam Shalansky's in the room, can I... Sam, can I pull you pull you up? Because you speak to a, a different part of the spectrum of questions that have come in. And just while Sam's coming coming up to the, uh, the microphone here, um, l l let me uh, say to people, particularly in webinar land, 
Um, Sam's been very active in the Australia-Indonesia space in all sorts of ways, and he and I encounter each other um, in the Victorian board of the Australia-Indonesia Business Council, where he's a, a key player. But Sam, you had a, had a terrific question um, uh, asking about strategies that Australia might explore to maintain the relationship with Indonesia in a low-contact world come as a surprise to Monash people the next bit of, where you say, where major universities are pulling back from Indonesia. Well, that's not what we're doing, but no, anyway. Happily, um, it's not about you at all. <laughs> it's not all about you guys, I know. <laughs> um, in, in, Interested just to draw you out, A, on anything you did or didn't hear from Gary on that, um, or just thoughts you'd like to put out in that space. I think a lot of people who have engaged with me now have a lot of thoughts that share, but I think building on what he said, I thought it was particularly interesting. He talked about the, he really, really emphasised what we've heard tonight, um, which is all about it's big teams, long time, and consistency. Um, and when we think about like that point, you know, we are friends. We're not, you know, maybe the most active, we don't have the longest litany of things we've done together, but we have a really close friendship that has mm -hmm. taken time to build. And that's really where that question came from, was if we've got these universities pulling back and that's what it takes, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a tough world we're walking into. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really exciting to be here mm -hmm. and to be, you know, in, in an institution that it really does care about the mm -hmm. relationship. Um, as we can see in this room, and all the people who joined us. So it's interesting to hear that sort of, this is what we need, and to think about this is what we've got, what resources we've got um, hmm. with us right now. Hmm. Sam, thanks very much. I'm getting serious looks from over there. So that that, means, <laughs> that you have, on. means you've got to get off the stage. Yeah. And, and I'm going to just say one more thing. Um, um, uh, and this is particularly for folks out there in, in, in webinar land. Watch the Herb Feath Centre space. There's all sorts of exciting programming that Sharon and her colleagues uh, are building up. And keep your eye on another bit of space too, and that's um, space that Vice-Chancellor Margaret Gardner referred to in her remarks, and that's the, uh, the new Monash campus coming in Jakarta later this year. Sharon, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Very sweet. Thank you. Uh, and for both of our speakers who came up, thank you also. Uh, I'm now going to turn over to our Dean, Sharon Pickering, who's going to give closing remarks. Thank you. Another Sharon. It's a festival of Sharons. Um, thanks so much, Sharon. And thank you so much for the energy and commitment that you've brought to the role uh, of director. You had big shoes to fill and it's just so fantastic to see how you have uh, moved into the role and as Andrew and the Vice-Chancellor have both said, the centre is very important, uh, is very important to us. There is no doubt that uh, sustaining and growing the bilateral relationship between Indonesia and Australia is at the forefront of Monash uh, intentions for the coming decade. And, of course, there's no surprise to us in a faculty of the humanities and social sciences because, of course, Indonesia has been a foundational part of the Monash story and no more foundational uh, than among uh, those of us in the humanities and social sciences. It would be remiss of me not to take a little opportunity I am struck by the ambassador's remarks um, and particularly the remarks then in the, uh, the question time around not just the bilateral relationship between Australia and Indonesia but other key partners in the region and most notably India. Just four weeks ago, we completed a virtual mobility program called uh, the Social Enterprise Challenge in the Asia-Pacific, uh, ran by our very own Dr Bernan Hedwards, who is the Director of the Global Immersion Guarantee, and we'd had 100 students attend, 33 from Monash, 33 from Atmajaya Catholic University in Jakarta, and 33 from Jindal University in India. Those, we are here to operationalise the strategic plans of our two nations. Those students worked in groups of three. 
an Australian student, an Indonesian student, and an Indian student. And they solved significant problems, and they had to do so um, under the mentorship of around about 25 industry mentors. They did the most remarkable job, and I do want to pay a, a, a special um, uh, vote of thanks uh, to our respective um, uh, missions in those countries who were so supportive of our students. So we can see not only the opportunities for this bilateral uh, relationship growing further and beyond that, we see that being lived in our students. And it is with young people that we see that future unfolding so positively between our nations and across the region. This has been a truly uh, hybrid event and while hybrid event, of course, done at speed, which is the COVID way, of course. And I particularly um, would like to thank our Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Margaret Gardner, not just for your warm and supportive opening comments, but for all of your leadership and support in this uh, space. To His Excellency Ambassador Quinlan, I am always grateful for the enthusiastic support he offers for all of our initiatives and endeavours, and uh, he has been a great friend. I also extend my personal and heartfelt thanks to Iba's speaker for her support during her time as Consul uh, General here in Victoria and Tasmania. I would uh, note, and I also am great, uh, grateful that Ibu uh, Muniro is here this evening. Indonesia has excellent form in sending Victoria and Tasmania truly exceptional women, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is absolutely fabulous. Uh, our thank you to Professor Andrew McIntyre. Not only is he able to help us set up a campus in Indonesia during a pandemic, but did you see see that Q&A talent. I mean, clearly we will be able uh, to utilise him in many future forums, both here and in Jakarta, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. And thanks again to, uh, uh, to Sharon uh, and the team uh, in the Herb Feed Centre, to Amy and to Lauren and everyone behind the scenes that made tonight uh, possible. The importance of our people-to-people -people relationships undergirds um, both where we have come from in this relationship and, importantly for all of us uh, here and online, our way forward. It's not just going to inform our education uh, and research, but so importantly and so abundantly apparent in the many Monash Indonesia networks that continue to flourish. So to all of you here uh, in person and all to you here online, I want to extend my thanks for your ongoing engagement and support. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to invite you all here to stay along for some canapes and drinks. But from now, we say thank you and good night to all our dear friends and colleagues online. Thank you and good night. <laughs>